All right, everybody. Uh, it's uh, five or four in Central European time. Um, uh, my name is Francesco Celerosi. I'm happy to be the, the chair of today's uh, Dinamici or Dinamici seminar. Um, uh, our speaker today is Sun Rose Shrestha from uh, Tufts University. Sun Rose uh, just um, finished his PhD under the supervision of Moon Duchin um, just a couple of months ago, recently. Um, he will be joining Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario in January. Um, and today he will tell us about the topology and the geometry of random um, uh, translation surfaces, or no, um, square tile surfaces. Um, one thing I should say is that we are live on uh, YouTube. And so by agreeing uh, to you know, be seen on, 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 the, on the video here, you agree to be live on YouTube. So the, the video is gonna be recorded. So just be aware that by, by asking a question or interacting during this, uh, this session, you will be, uh, you agree to be live on YouTube as well. Um, all right, without further ado, um, let's give the stage to Sunrose. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, coming to this talk. And thank you, Francesco and uh, others, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to speak in this seminar. Um, it's been a slow summer so far for me. <laughs> um, today, I will talk about the topology and geometry of random uh, square tiled surfaces. And this was uh, the results in this uh, talk are part of uh, my dissertation that I had, uh, that was advised by Moon Dujin at Tufts University. <clears throat> so let me begin the talk by telling you about translation surfaces, um, because square tile surfaces are particular examples of translation surfaces. So knowing about translation surfaces um, helps us put square tile surfaces in perspective. Uh, a translation surface is a finite collection of Euclidean polygons embedded in the plane up to translations with edges glued in pairs such that glued edges are parallel and of equal length. And as you move along a glued edge, you should see one polygon to the left and one to the right. Uh, so that's a good condition. And what's not allowed is something like this, okay? So the edges are glued here by translation. Uh, let's look at some examples right away. The most basic example is probably the square torus, right? With one square, units Euclidean square and opposite edges, um, opposite size identified by translation. Another example is the regular octagon um, with opposite edges identified by translation as so, and something, you know, a little bit more arbitrary here. Uh, I've taken two polygons with just the um, gluing conditions you know, satisfied. Okay, that's also a translation surface. So these surfaces, um, they are everywhere flat except for finitely many cone points, uh, finitely many points, which I'll call cone points. Uh, and that's because you know these surfaces are built out of uh, Euclidean polygons. Okay. And so at every cone point, the angle will be an integer multiple of two pi. And I'll write it as so, okay? And that's because if you start measuring the angle at a cone point, if you start on an edge, uh, the only way you're going to uh, finish measuring is to come back to uh, a copy of that edge, like the pair of that edge that's parallel to it. So you must have gone around uh, an integer multiple of and whole uh, rounds to come back. Um, so that's why I wrote it this way. And the alphas are kind of expecting the, um, representing the angle excess, like how much multiple of two pi there's an excess, okay? So let's look at, um, lo look at these examples and you know, familiar, familiarize ourselves with the cone points. Um, so the torus doesn't have a cone point. You can see that actually that, you know, even though it appears to have this special point, it's actually not a special point. The angle is still two pi, okay? Uh, in the octagon, you can actually follow the gluing and find that all of these vertices are 
all of these corners are identified to a single vertex. And the angle actually is 6 pi um, around that cone point. OK? And that's the only cone point in that surface. Um, you can do a similar thing uh, here in this other surface. So you can start following the edge glowings. Here, I'm just going to carry out the identification, right? And you're back. Uh, another cone point would be another vertex that's left. Um, okay. And, you, you know, you can do an appropriate triangulation and find that both the angles are 4 pi in this case. Okay. The angle around the uh, cone point. Uh, the genus of these surfaces are uh, given by this formula here. And, you know, you can do an Euler characteristic argument to get at this formula or, you know, a simple Gauss-Bonnet uh, will suffice. And it's really that the, you know, curvature of these surfaces, the negative curvature is concentrated at the cone points. So the, no, just knowing the angles around the cone points is sufficient to give um, the genus of these surfaces. Okay. Now, in general, the cone point data can be recorded in a vector like this. I'll call, I've called it alpha. So alpha i are really recording the angle excess, and s is the number of cone points. Okay. And the collection of translation surfaces that share the same cone point data is called a stratum and denoted as H of alpha, okay? For alpha, the cone point data. In general, these uh, strata, they have orbital structure. And you can uh, think about, um, you know, like neighborhoods via this kind of cartoon picture that I have over here. Um, it's not very formal, but really if you have a surface, you know, say the octagon that we already saw, uh, four vectors suffice to give you the surface if you know it's a translation surface, right? And these four vectors can be perturbed to get a, another octagon surface that's, you know, in the neighborhood of the surface, okay? And so these, these are the uh, local coordinates. Uh, to be more precise, you have to pick a basis of for the relative first homology um, relative to these cone points and so on. But really like this is the kind of the geometric idea. Um, and these vectors, you know, they go from cone point to cone point and they are called, uh, or like the curves that join from cone point to the cone point, they're called saddle connections, okay? And the vectors that describe the displacements are um, called holonomy vectors in general. Um, and more formally, a saddle connection is a geodesic segment from a cone point to another cone point, uh, not necessarily a different cone point, but without any cone points in the interior. Okay. So, for example, in this in in this surface, um, we can look at some cone points. So this is, oh, look at some Holonomy vectors and saddle connections. So this is a saddle connection. And the Holonomy vector associated to that is just one, one, because it's X and Y displacement, one each. Um, you can have something maybe like this. And the X displacement in this case is one, the Y displacement is two. And you can also have something like, use the same color. Uh, this, which is um, two one, okay. So these are saddle connections, and I'll be studying these uh, as well. And for this talk, I've uh, I'm going to denote whole S as the set of holonomy vectors of that arise as saddle connections from that surface, and I'm viewing them in R two, okay, or square tall surfaces. So really easy to. Now, a basic example of what a Holonomy set could look like 
is for the standard square torus that we already saw. And uh, it's not hard to convince yourself that it's exactly the set of points in Z2 such that the um, X and Y coordinates are relatively prime, okay? And that's because you're not allowed to have uh, another cone point in the interior. Um, and I should also say that the torus is kind of a degenerate case. It doesn't have a cone point. So you have to mark a point to be able to study you know, cone points or uh, saddle connections you know, on the surface. Okay, and I'll denote that this set, uh, this special set in uh, Z2 comprised of the primitive vectors as RP for standing for relatively prime. Now, translation surfaces are stu well studied uh, by a lot of people and they, you know, arise in multiple ways, but really two ways that, you know, concern uh, people in dynamics, I would say. Um, the first is in the study of polygonal billiards. So if you have a polygon that has angles that are rational multiples of pi, then studying a billiard trajectory inside that polygon, you can associate it um, to studying um, a curve inside a translation surface. And that's via an unfolding construction, which let me show you using a GIF or something that I drew at some point. So I have it up. So you're playing billiards in this square and every time it hits an edge, you're going to reflect the table and preserve the orientation or you know, keep track of the orientation and um, let the trajectory go in a straight line. So if you do that in all of the edges, you're going to get a uh, torus, like, like so. Let me play it again, because that was maybe a little bit fast. And you might've already seen this, it's fairly famous. Um, Right, so you get uh, this trajectory on the, uh, a curve on the torus that's associated to the trajectory. Um, so that's, you know, studying billiards, but um, relatedly, it also, the translation surface also show up in type neuro theory. And especially because of the viewpoint, uh, kind of the complex analytic viewpoint. So instead of viewing these surfaces in R2, you can view them in, um, you know, see the complex plane. And so it inherit, inherits a complex structure. Like, so these surfaces are Riemann surfaces, uh, but with additional information, they also have a uh, holomorphic one form. Uh, and that one form is really the pullback of the DZ one form in uh, the complex plane. And it pulls back nicely because um, we have um, a, you know, translation gluings. So, the, you know, you, you, in local coordinates, the, in, in, in charts that overlap, the, the um, one form agrees. So because of this extra information, they form a vector bundle over uh, Teichmuller space. And in particular, it actually is part of the cotangent bundle. And so you can even realize Teichmuller geodesics in the Teichmuller metric uh, as determined by um, you know, these uh, like one forms on, on your uh, Teichmuller space, okay? On, on top of your Teichmuller space. So that's also, you know, more of a dynamical uh, reason why people care about these. Now let's move on to the main object of this talk, which are square tile surfaces. Um, a square tile surface is just a translation surface where the polygons are axis parallel Euclidean unit squares. And here are some examples. Uh, we've already seen the torus, uh, it's the most basic example. Here's an example in genus two, it lives in H2, uh, which means that the, the cone point angle is six pi. And here's an example, another example in genus two with two cone points with angle four pi each. 
Okay. Um, are there any questions so far? I'm seeing some chat um, stuff. Yeah, no, I don't. I didn't see any question. People really okay. like the the animation that you showed. And I should say that if uh, anybody has questions, feel free to write them in the chat, and I'll relay them to some oh, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'll, I'm keeping yeah, an eye on the chat. I won't keep track of the chat then. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. Thanks. Um, so there are other ways to view uh, translation services, uh, the square tall services in particular. Um, they can be viewed as branch covers of the standard square torus with exactly one branch point. And also they can be viewed as uh, translation surfaces which have holonomy vectors in Z2. Okay. Um, and this viewpoint is in particularly nice uh, because as I described earlier, we had these um, you know, vectors um, that give local coordinates for strata, right? And the vote, those vectors were in uh, R2, but really because of the translation services having holonomy vectors in Z2, they have a lattice-like structure inside, the, inside their strata. Um, and because of this lattice-like structure, you can count square tile surfaces up to a certain number of squares, um, just like you can count lattice points in Euclidean space and you know, get volume of estimations of strata, just like you can get volume estimations in um, Euclidean space. Um, and that kind of um, you know, uh, viewpoint has been exploited by Zorich Eskin Gokunkov to compute the uh, volume in strata. And what, what I mean by volume is um, the Maser Beach volume, which is really just Lebesgue measure um, in those local coordinates. Okay, pull back by those local coordinates. Uh, so square tall surfaces are, have a particularly, you know, um, nice place in the hearts of people who study translation services because of, you know, this reason. I'll, I'll denote square tall services with n squares as STSN. Uh, as I go forth and stuff. Okay. Um, so with all of that, we are now ready to uh, dive into the main theorems. So I'll pre present two theorems. Uh, the first one is the genus theorem. And it's motivated by the question, if I randomly take n squares and start gluing them to form a translation surface, what's the genus of that surface? Um, of course, I have to make precise what random is, uh, which I'm going to do in a bit, but you know, let's think about it. Or I, I would, I would um, ask the audience to guess, like make some guesses maybe. Uh, Francisco, you've already seen this talk, so I don't know uh, if, you'd, <laughs> if you'd like to guess the correct answer, <laughs> but um, any guesses from the audience? Of what the expected genus should be. Uh, is it log n um, or is it quadratic in n? Square root n over two. Square root n over two. Those are good guesses, um, maybe. But really the, the answer, uh, since I'm not seeing that many guesses, um, the answer is n over two. So that's the leading term, but we have, um, we can get a little bit more precise. Um, okay, uh, with the secondary terms as well. And gamma here is the euler mascherani constant. And it's roughly 0 0.577. And the variance, you know, is about log n. Gamma over four minus pi squared over two plus. And so you'll see like why really like these kind of stuff, uh, these constants appear uh, in a bit um, towards the end of the talk. So a few remarks are in order. Um, the distribution is act actually asymptotically normal. Although I've like presented only the uh, expected genus and the 
variants. And it was initially proven by Sabine Lepner, but they used a different method, uh, same model, but a different method. And what our method does is it generalizes to polygon tile surfaces. So what I mean by that is instead of thinking of building surfaces out of squares, translation surfaces out of squares, you can think of building translation surfaces out of octagons. Take a bunch of regular octagons and start gluing uh, sides by um, parallel translation and you'll get a translation surface and you can ask the same question, what's the genus, uh, expected genus. And also our method allows investigation into the holonomy set of these uh, surfaces, uh, which is the content of the next theorem, okay? So the next theorem I'll call the holonomy theorem. And again, it's kind of a guessing game, but given a random square tile surface, uh, I haven't described what random means. What's the probability that you'll get uh, your holonomy set to be exactly equal to the primitive vectors in Z2, right? And what's the probability that you'll contain the primitive vectors in Z2? Those are the sort of the, um, sort of the two like kind of the guiding questions, okay? And- Sun Rose, we have a question about the distribution of cone point curvatures. So I'm guessing if you generate at random a bunch of these square uh, tile surfaces, how many cone points will there be and what's going to be their uh, alphas? Oh yeah, uh, I'll get to that. I, I, dropped something. I will get to that towards the end of the talk. Okay, thank you. Yeah, like I'll definitely cover that uh, towards the end of the talk. Thank you. So the, the probability that it actually has exactly equal the same holonomy vectors as the torus is one over E that converges to one over E. And um, the probability that it actually contains the holonomy vectors of the torus is one. So in other words, these square tile surfaces do preserve a lot of, you know, you know uh, some pro geometric property of the torus in the sense that it contains all the Alani vectors of the torus, mostly, okay? I'll call a surface that satisfies the first property of having exactly the same Alani vectors of the torus as a Alani torus, um, and a surface that contains these primitive vectors, but may have more as visibility torus. Um, and you might even ask like, why is there an, even an example of a surface that, you know, is, is, a, is not a visibility torus? And in fact, they are not that hard to, you know, come up with. And in fact, this is an example that I already like showed you. So for the visibility torus, you assume a strict inclusion? Uh, not necessarily, no. Halami okay. tori are also visibility. Okay. okay. Yeah. And so in this, in this case, what happens is that if you move in the horizontal direction to the right from any representative of the cone point, you have to travel at least two steps to come back to it, right? In all of these directions. So visually you can see that um, one zero, the Halani vector. So one zero is not in the Halani set of the surface. Okay, and so this surface is not a visibility torus um, by definition, because it misses one of the primitive vectors. Um, now let me talk about how these re two results uh, relate to the past. Um, so random surfaces are not new. People have studied random surfaces with different metrics um, before and Although I've mentioned some name here, I'm probably missing a lot more. Like I'm, I already noticed that I've missed uh, Harriet Zagier, um, which is also a kind of a foundational paper. Um, but <clears throat> they have studied random surfaces before. People have studied random surfaces, but 
not necessarily translation services, although translation services have also been studied. Um, uh, in particular, I want to compare the genus theorem to a result by Gambert, who says that given a random n square surface, again, not necessarily translation um, gluings, uh, what's the expected genus? Okay. And he says that the expected genus is this expression here. Okay. And it looks awfully similar to what we have. But except for this, you know, additive um, constant of log four over two. And the reason that, you know, there might be different reasons, but the the really the reason is that um, we're using a different model, so it might be just an artifact of the model. Uh, but another heuristic reason for this like loss in genus is that Gambert because he's not restricting to n square or because he's not restricting to translation gluings, he can actually make spheres, whereas we can't make spheres. So there might be a loss of genus from spheres appearing uh, on the surfaces as well, okay? Now the Holonomy theorem also can be related to some results in the past, um, notably by uh, Eskin Mazur who in 2001 proved that for any stratum, there exists a constant that only depends on the stratum such that for almost all surfaces, translation surfaces in that stratum, the number of Halani vectors up to length R, so this is denoting the number of Halani vectors up to length R, grows quadratically with this constant, okay? And, um, Dozier actually improved on this theorem and uh, improved it to for all surfaces uh, in the stratum. Again, the underlying measure is the maser veach measure, uh, which is Lebesgue and the lo those local coordinates, um, pulled by by the local coordinates. And, but, you know, there's some caveat that, you know, there's, you have to look at large enough uh, R, like radius. Okay. He also has an upper bound, but his uh, lower bound uh, constant, but his lower bound constant depends on um, the surface, whereas his upper bound constant doesn't. So people have looked at, you know, these holonomy vectors, but, uh, and I'm kind of lying a little bit here. They've actually studied the number of saddle connections up to length R, right? But uh, it's roughly, you know, the set, the number of holonomy vectors as well. Um, and so the major difference is that they're looking at all translation surfaces with respect to the maser veach measure, right? And the maser veach measure doesn't see square tile surfaces. So if you look at a stratum and, you know, the square tile surfaces in that stratum have zero maser veach measure. Um, and also we're varying uh, the number of squares, right? We're not fixing the number of cone points, but because they're fixing the stratum, they're actually fixing the angle of the cone points and the number of the cone points. Um, so it's really a kind of an orthogonal um, theorem in a sense, like a complementary theorem, um, the aligning theorem for these uh, past ones. So now let me tell you about the randomizing model. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, like, you know, you might think, you know, the square tile surfaces are really nice. There should be something very combinatorial uh, that's, you know, going on. And it is, you know, square tile surfaces can be represented by two permutations, okay? One that comes from the horizontal gluing and the other com coming from the vertical gluing. And I'll describe how to get these two permutations from a surface uh, by this example. So let me start by, uh, labeling the squares like so. And sigma will be my permutation that describes what the neighbors to the right are of any square, okay? So I start with one. Um, to the right of one is two. And to the right of two is three. And to the right of three, 
because of this gluing is one. And so four has itself as its right neighbor and five has itself as its right neighbor. So I get this permutation. And similarly, tau describes what's glued to the top of a square. So one is glued to itself on the top, right? And two is glued to, uh, five is glued to two on the top and four is glued to the top of five and you're back at two. And three has itself as the top neighbor. So you get these two permutations from this um, Swiss cross surface. Uh, you can imagine doing something like this to go backwards and given two permutations, you can start building a surface and actually you'll get a labeled surface um, by this procedure, uh, reversing this procedure. And if you don't wanna care about the labeling, um, that would correspond to simultaneous conjugacy classes of these pairs of permutations, okay? So really SN cross SN mod simultaneous conjugacy is in bijection with SDSN, okay? And when I'm thinking of SDSN, I'm not necessarily thinking of connected surfaces, because you, you can get disconnected surfaces if you choose the permutations poorly. Uh, but the probability of that happening uh, as n goes to infinity is again, zero, uh, converges to zero. So, you know, this is in fact a good model to even get connected surfaces. And so instead of, you know, taking the, you know, simultaneous conjugate classes, we will take the random model as just SN cross SN because it's easier to work with. And also it's mimicking, um, you know, past conventions in random group theory and random graph theory where the models are not in bijection with the objects that they're representing, especially because the isomorphism problem is difficult in those settings. Um, and the third reason really is that uh, one should expect surfaces that have a lot of relabeling um, to be symmetric in some way. And so as n grows to infinity, you shouldn't be seeing too many symmetric objects. Um, so the, the proportion of those symmetric ones should be going to zero as well. So this should be a good model as n goes to infinity. Um, although that is something still I want to make more precise um, in an upcoming project that I'm thinking about. Now, Let's learn how to use this very combinatorial model. Um, the first lemma I want to, or maybe an observation, it's been around um, in the literature or not even in the literature, it's more like a folklore kind of lemma, uh, is the vertex gluing lemma. Um, so given a square tile surface that's given by these two permutations, um, Square I and square J have their bottom left corners glued under the, under the identification, if and only if I and J are in the same cycle of the commutative, okay? So it's a common control condition um, picking out something geometric. And let me uh, illustrate this direction using a simple case. So let's assume you know, as kind of an induction hypothesis almost, that I and J are right next to each other. In fact, J follows I in the cycle that they're in. And then we can translate what that means geometrically in the sense that um, tau inverse of I is glued to the bottom of I. That's just by definition. And again, by definition, sigma inverse tau inverse of I is the left neighbor of tau inverse of I. And similarly, tau sigma inverse tau inverse of i is the top neighbor, right? And then because j is sigma inverse, so this commutator times i, we should have this edge glued to this edge, right? Because sigma, sigma hit this thing should be giving you j. And so that means that this, these two corners are identified. Now the upshot of that um, very elementary like lemma is that 
the number of equivalence classes of vertices is equal to the number of disjoint cycles of the commutator, okay? Because, you know, every commutator, uh, every cycle is representing a left, bottom left vertex, but then every vertex in the surface has to be a bottom left for some square. And in fact, this, the proof actually gives us a little bit more. Um, it gives us that the, if the cycle length is greater than or equal to two, then that should correspond to a cone point of angle two pi L minus one, okay? And in particular also that fixed points of commutators should correspond to non-cone point vertices, okay? Because that, that look like this. And that's because going one step in the commutator corresponds to going around once, you know, once. And if you were a fixed point, then that means you just glued up to yourself and you get a two pi angle. So, and this will be important for the next lemma. So I'm harping on it a little bit more. Now the next lemma is the holonomy characterization lemma. And so let me go back and kind of you can already see the hints of like the angle distribution as well coming up uh, for that earlier question. Uh, so you're, I'm getting at the answer uh, towards you know getting the angle distribution as well. Now the holonomy characterization lemma is really a combinatorial condition picking out holonomy tori. So it says that the connect like a connected surface with sigma and tau as its uh, permutations is a holonomy torus if and only if sigma tau, the commutator is fixed point free. And, and the idea is that if S is not a holonomy torus, that should happen if and only if there exists some vector that's not primitive and in the holonomy of uh, your surface, okay? And that exactly happens if there exists a non cone point vertex, right, one of those like um, square corners that don't form a cone point in that saddle connection that realizes W, okay? And that happens as we just saw, if and only if uh, there exists a fixed point uh, corresponding to that non cone point vertex. So fixed point free commutators pick out um, holonomy torus. The next lemma is somewhat similar. It's picking out um, visibility tori, and it's a sufficient condition for a uh, surface to be visibility. So a square tile surface with these permutations, two permutations, is vis visibility torus if uh, the commutator has less than n over two cycles. Okay. And the intuition is somewhat similar in, in the sense that um, if you have less than n over two cycles, then you don't have that many space for fixed points. And so there aren't that many non-cone point vertices in your surface, okay? So for example, here, the, the obstruction of this surface being a visibility, uh, one of the obstructions at least, is that, you know, these are the non cone point vertices that appear, right? And because of those appearing, you don't have a one zero solid connection, right? You have to go through that. Um, enough of them appear that every, everywhere you look, you have to travel distance two to get to yourself um, in the horizontal direction. And so that's the intuition, although this is less of a sketch than um, the previous one. Um, the proof isn't quite this. The takeaway of these three lemmas is that you have a way of going from the geometry and topology of square tile surfaces to cycle statistics of commutators, okay? So now you've turned the problem into a combinatorial problem, you know, purely. And so the next lemma will be the commutator distribution lemma. And to set it up, uh, let me introduce some notation. 
So let WN be the word map coming, uh, coming from the commutator. So it's taking a pair of permutations and evaluating the commutator. And so using that uh, word map, you can push the uniform distribution on SN cross SN, which is our random model, remember, to a probability distribution on AN. Um, and how you would do that is by, for any permutation in AN, looking at the number of premages under this map and appropriately normalizing it. And so the commutator distribution lemma tells you that this new pr uh, probability distribution that you got on AN is not that different from the uniform distribution on AN. Um, in fact, this is the growth rate uh, or decay rate. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, so we have a question uh, about uh, why the word visibility for visibility tutorials? What's the intuition for using oh, the word visibility? Right. Um, the visible lattice points from the origin, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the relatively prime, the primitive vectors in Z2 are exactly the visible lattice points if you sit at the origin. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the reason that we use visibility. Thank you. And so um, this, you know, this distance is the, um, the total variation distance. And you can kind of think of as the soup distance because uh, it's, you know, looking at how, how different the two measures are in, uh, or like what's the maximum difference between the two measures uh, over the sets. So really, you know, in the limit, this new distribution still converges to the uniform distribution in AN, okay? And to sketch a proof of this, we need a little bit of representation theory. So let me set up some notation um, for some representation theory. So rho will be my representation from a group to a uh, GLF a vector space, and chi will denote a character. The Fourier transform of a probability measure at a representation is defined to be uh, this expression here. And what you're doing is you're summing over the representation, uh, the weighted by the, this probability. Okay, so this in particular is going to be in GLP. It's just a matrix. Uh, and so Diakonis and Sasha Hani give this nice general um, lemma, which gives an upper bound to how far your probability measure can differ from the uniform measure um, in terms of this Fourier representation, okay? So in particular, the square of the total variation distance is bounded above by this expression here, where you're summing over the irreducible representations that are not the identity and uh, looking at the trace of this product of, you know, the Fourier transforms. The, the, the star is just the complex conjugate, okay? And so this is some expression that turns the problem into a little bit of representation theory. So the sketch of the proof is going to use that as the starting point. So the starting point really is the diakonis sashani lemma applied to our case. So we have PWN as the probability that's induced by pushing forward the uniform on the pairs, or uniform distribution on the pairs. And U of AN is outright the uniform distribution on AN. And so that distance is bounded by this expression here where you're now summing over the representations of SN instead of AN. And uh, again, the similar expression uh, regarding the Fourier transform. And to use this, we need an, you know, we need a nice form for this, the Fourier transform. And that can be attained by using a formula of Frobenius. It's very classical, uh, actually more general than the symmetric group. And it's given by, you know, the probability of any pi in AN is given by this expression here in terms of the characters of uh, irreducible characters of SN. 
And so using, you know, just some manipulation, you can get at a very nice expression for the Fourier transform of this measure. Uh, and in the end, you only, all you need to, you know, all you've left with is a scalar matrix, um, you know, scaled by one over dimension of the representation. And so plugging that in and using an estimate of leaving Chalep, you get the required result. Okay. So it's really a hodgepodge of different, um, you know, results kind of stringing together. Uh, it's not something that's overly, um, you know, too, too exciting, I guess. Uh, but what, what's the upshot again? Uh, the big picture after this, you know, some representation theory is that if you want the geometry and topology of square tile surfaces, you can use the model to re relate it to the, you know, psychosynthesis of commutators for uniformly distributed pairs in the symmetric group. And then you can relate it to, you know, using this commutator distribution lemma, the cycle statistics of um, uniformly distributed permutations in AN. Okay. Oh, I didn't realize the end of the show. Um, and so, you know, this part is uh, more classical, like studied more. And so, because, you know, we've converted the geometry and topology question into this. All we need to now do is um, read off facts about AN and then push it back to um, square tile surfaces. Okay. So now let's look at some facts. I wanna end by looking at some facts about AN. The first fact is that the probability, the, the density of fixed point free permutations or derangements in AN uh, is one over E, right? And that's exactly corresponding to uh, the density of holonomy tori being one over E. Because remember, um, the holonomy characterization lemma said that uh, the commutator, you know, commutators that appear as derangements, which don't have, fixed, like, that is, they don't have fixed points, exactly pick out the holonomy tori, but like the number of, the density of the commutators that don't have fixed points is similar to the density of, or converges to the density of permutations in AN that don't have fixed points. And so I'm not gonna go through, you know, I was planning on going through a cute way of seeing that, but it's fine, it's just combinatorial. Um, the next fact is that the probability of a permutation having less than n over two cycles in AN goes to one. And what that corresponds to because of the common control visibility lemma is that, you know, the probability that your surface is a visibility torus converges to one. Um, so that's already proving the Holonomy theorem. Um, the third fact is that the average number of cycles of um, permutations in AN is this number, where the first sum is the nth harmonic number and there's something that's gonna go to zero as n goes to infinity. And the, enth har the harmonic numbers grow as log n plus gamma. In fact, I think this other Mascherani constant is defined to be that leftover um, of the harmonic you know, numbers and log n. And so what that corresponds to in our land, the square tile land, is that the expected genus of a random square tile surface is this expression. And I, all I need to do is use, use the Euler characteristic formula uh, because once I'm fixing the number of squares, I'm fixing F, the number of faces. And I'm also fixing E because the edges are glued in pairs. And so the V, the number of vertices is given by the number of cycles of the commutator which is in turn is related to the number of cycles of permutations in AN. Um, and so now to answer finally, like the, the question that was posed earlier, um, uh, the average number of fixed points of a permutation in AN is one. Uh, 
And so what that means is that the expected number of singularities or I guess cone points, I've been using cone points, uh, but I sometimes go back and forth similarities. Extra number of cone points uh, is log n plus gamma, which is the uh, number of vertices minus the number of fixed points, which corresponds to the non-cone point vertices. Right? And so this is uh, the expected number of cone points. And even more, um, the normalized cycle lengths of a permutation in AN, what I mean by that is or I guess I should say ordered normalized cycle lengths um, and normalized by N. So the order normalized cycle lengths, they follow this uh, distribution called the poisson Dirichlet distribution, which is um, which arises from this uh, random stick breaking process. Uh, and it's easy to describe. You take a stick of length one, uh, and then randomly break off a piece from the left. And then what's uh, break off another piece randomly from what's left and keep breaking off and then order the broken off pieces. Um, and so you get um, this, uh, you know, like a distribution in zero and one, right? And everything summing up to one. And that distribution, that like sequence of breaks is given by a Poisson Dirichlet distribution. And so that's what the normalized cycle lengths for permutations in AN follows. And so it governs, you know, distribution for the, among the strata as well as Poisson Dirichlet distribution. Um, not, not on the dot, but um, it's asymptotically that. Sanros, uh, um, we have a question from uh, Ian Frankel. He's asking, so you said earlier that the, the disconnected surfaces go to zero, the probability of them being disconnected goes to zero. How fast does it go to zero? Uh, so the probability of two permutations giving a, um, you know, so, so let, me, let me qualify that by saying, the, the thing that actually governs uh, connectivity is transitivity of those two permutations. So if you if those two permutations generate a transitive subgroup uh, of SN, which means when it acts on one through n, you know it's transitive, then um, then it gives a connected surface, and so the probability of those uh, you know probability of generating a transitive subgroup by pairs is uh, roughly one minus one over n, or order big O of one over n minus yeah. So it's uh, going, yeah, decaying as uh, one minus one over n, I would say. And what about the curvatures at the cone angles? Could there be like, since there's log n approximately cone angles, could there be some that have a lot of excess angle and some that have very little? Or how, how is the distribution of the actual excess angles, the alphas? Yeah, so um, that's, that's governed by um, this other, like, um, result I, uh, Goncharov, I think, like classical result by Goncharov, I think, uh, that's, I forget the exact constant. It's like 0.6 N is the largest cycle, like expected largest cycle of a permutation. Um, like the length of the longest cycle. You mean? Yeah, length of the longest cycle. Yeah, expected, yeah. It, length of the longest cycle is about 0.6 N. And so that's um, giving the length that's relating to the length of the largest uh, cone point. Um, yeah. Another question from Dima, he's asking uh, if we pick a random point uh, on a random surface and take a ball of radius, let's say a hundred or a thousand, does this have a distribution? Does this distribution have a limit? Mm. I am not, yeah, I, I'm not sure, uh, but I, I have been sort of thinking about um, a similar problem. Um, so what I've been thinking about is um, the covering radius, which is which is similar. It's not the diameter, I guess, but it's it's um, it's if you if you take a point and then grow a ball, 
and it reaches a cone point, right? So the, what's the largest radius of you know such a ball before reaching a cone point? Um, and that's called the covering radius. And I have been sort of experimenting kind of with that. Um, what I've found so far is that if you are a holonomy torus, you're bound to have covering radius um, one over square root of two. So roughly about 33 like, or 37% you know, of the time, one over E percent of the time, you get um, uh, one over square root of two. But the exact distribution of like the rest of the um, such radii, I don't know. Yeah, if that answers your question, Diva. We have another question also from Dima. I also had this question in mind. So, if you if you make a, a random surface with lots of squares and then you pick a, a random direction, how does the the dynamics look like in that direction? Uh, or Dima is asking specifically about the the time, the return time. Oh, I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Uh, um, but if you <clears throat> if you take, uh, for example, vertical direction, when this is just uh, related to the cycle, yes, which was from yeah, the, the vertical and the horizontal is just related to like the length of the yeah the cycle in the of sigma or tau, mm -hmm. uh, depending on yeah. Okay. But yeah, a random direction, uh, I do not know. Yeah, I think it would, it would, yeah, it's like one of the things that you could do is to make uh, every direction vertical by applying an appropriate action of SL2Z and looking at an appropriate space, like a surface on, um, on the SL2Z orbit. Um, and so one could study this by just taking, studying the horizontal ones, but I think there's um, a little interplay with the dynamics there that one could do. But I haven't really thought about it too much. I think we are. We, that's it for questions. Yeah. So actually, yeah. So uh, that was that was it. That that's the end of my talk too. <laughs> so well, if you have any questions, yeah. Thank let's you. first give a round of applause to uh, to Sunrose. I don't know. If you can <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we had a lot of uh, uh, good questions. Um, any, any more questions from the audience um, before we turn off the YouTube uh, live talk? Oh, there, we have a, a, a question from uh, Mauro. Mauro, do you want to ask it yourself? No, I mean, it's... Sorry, it's it's not a question. It's a it's more like a. I mean, it's it's a stupid remark. Just saying that square tires are beach surfaces, right? So they they reach the dichotomy holds. So if you take a random geodesic, it's not going to be a saddle connection, because saddle connection has measure zero. So it's going to be uniquely ergodic by each dichotomy. But that doesn't answer uh, Dima's question. This was just a comment that like I mean, but it's a stupid right. observation. Nothing 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 deep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thanks certainly. For the talk. Yeah. It was really nice. <laughs> Yeah. We have another question about going beyond just squares. Yes, yeah. So I've only thought about um, thought about the genus for beyond squares. Um, and if you're looking at, let's say, like a you know polygon with two um, k sides then roughly the, um, the genus is k minus one and over two. So you would need k permutations to encode that, right? Yeah, you would need k permutations to encode that. Um, and a similarly, you know, it's like a generalization of the commutator would give you um, the genus and similar like uh, words, similar like all of the analogous things for the genus hold. Um, as well, but but there's a parity issue when k is even something else happens and when k is odd something else happens. So because because of that, I didn't want to uh, expound on you know expand on that too much because you get lost in the details and and our passes. Um, but but definitely like it works. Uh, the holonomy theorem is a little bit trivial for um, 
these ones because when you're branching over an octagon tile surface or you know the regular octagon then then all of your cone points just travel up or all of the saddle connections just flipped because there's no places where you have um, as in the square there's no places of vertices meeting but not meet not, not having a cone point um, that ha doesn't happen if you're lifting uh, so so the holomy theorem doesn't really like say much maybe there is something more to be said um, like a finer question to be asked uh, on, on that but I don't know that off the top of my head yeah, so unless you need uh, the screen anymore, you can um, stop sharing okay. your screen. Um, any more uh, question, I guess, so people can see your face uh, bigger. Any, any more questions from the audience uh, before we thank our speaker again? Keeping track of the questions. Uh, while people are thinking, I'm, I'm going to ask one last question. So earlier you mentioned that in the genus, you have this um, um, expectation roughly n over two and this variance uh, log n, I think. And you said that with those expectation and variance, the behavior is approximately uh, normal, right? So do you, do you have a rate at which uh, this suitably rescaled um, quantity uh, converges to a Gaussian? How, how quickly does does it look normal? Um, yes, there is a rate, um, but yeah, I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but the, it, it can be, it can be written, it can be found. Yeah, it can be, it can be done. Yeah, because of the um, because of the convergence to um, uniform, like uh, because of the convergence to uniform is one over n, uh, roughly, and then. The con the there is also a statistic for the convergence to asymptotically normal of cycles number of cycles of an, and so you can piece it together uh, and get a rough uh, estimate. Yeah. Thank you. All right. I guess I don't see any more questions, so I would say let's thank Sun Rose again. Uh, thank you. <laughs>